Good afternoon, and welcome to the COVID-19 and Health Inequities Seminar Series presented to you by the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. This is the fourth talk in a five-part series running through next Thursday, October 22nd. I'm your moderator, Emma Corsi, and today we are excited to welcome Dr. Tangela Purnell from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and the Johns Hopkins Urban Health Institute. Let's get started by covering a few logistics. This seminar series is being recorded, so please turn off your camera if you do not wish to be recorded. The recording will be available on the website at a later point in time. At approximately 2.45, we'll stop for questions. Throughout the talk, you can send questions via the chat function to Tori Kauger. We are thrilled to have Dr. Purnell with us today. Dr. Purnell is an epidemiologist and health services researcher with over a decade of research experience related to identifying and addressing patient family, healthcare system, and community factors influencing health and healthcare disparities for adults with cardiovascular disease risk factors, including hypertension, chronic kidney disease, and diabetes. She is an assistant professor of cardiovascular disease and clinical epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. In her role as an Associate Director of the Johns Hopkins Urban Health Institute, Dr. Purnell co-leads the Institute's efforts to facilitate and recognize collaborations between communities, universities, healthcare delivery systems, government, and the private sector to build collective capacity for achieving health equity in Baltimore. Let's get started. Dr. Purnell, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Emma, for your uh, warm welcome. And also, you know, thank you all who are the organizers of today's events. I um, really appreciate the invitation to be here. And so um, I wanted to talk to you all a little bit about many of the same topics that I'm sure you're aware of. Race, Racism and Health Disparities in COVID-19 is the title of the talk. And, you know, we'll talk a little bit about each of these things and everything in between. And so I look forward to this being, um, you know, more of a dynamic conversation at the end, um, hearing both from your experiences and the things that you are concerned about or care about, as well as hearing about some of the things that we are doing here at Johns Hopkins. And so we will get started. Oh, apologies for some reason. I'm not quite sure. Let's try it maybe third time's the charm. All right, it is. All right, so as you know, we are in the middle of a pandemic. I don't have to say much about that. And so this is just the current dashboard from our Johns Hopkins coronavirus tracking um, you know, map here. And essentially what we all know is that we are in trouble. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Globally, we have way too many cases. And nationally, we have way too many cases and way too many deaths. Um, we also, you know, often a picture, they say, is worth a thousand words. And so often, you know, we go to Google to find everything else. And I figured, well, why not Google um, just what pops up if we type COVID in death? And so this was a little earlier in the pandemic, which, if you recall, we saw lots of images coming from other places, including Italy. And then, you know, here in the US, we then saw that New York was um, becoming much of an epicenter at that time, followed by Texas and other places. Now we pretty much, you know, see that this is a problem all over the country. And some of the places that were really on the radar earlier in the pandemic have now done a much better job at uh, reducing the number of new cases and the number of deaths, yet this is still a significant problem. So this is just a reminder, you know, from the CDC that not everyone is being equally um, impacted by these cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. And so this is um, a chart which actually um, just highlights the fact that we now know be after finally having some data that is stratified by race ethnicity, we now know that American Indian or Alaska Native uh, persons, as well as uh, Black or African American and Hispanic or Latinx persons are all much more likely than non-Hispanic white persons to end up being diagnosed with COVID-19, 
to end up with very severe illness that leads to hospitalization and also unfortunately um, ending up dying from COVID-19. And this, these numbers are not even age adjusted. Once we um, now have access to many of the age adjusted numbers, we now know that this looks even worse than what this current um, graph is showing us. Let's go back to Google again, right? And so we talked about lots of these categories that we often use. So I Googled COVID black and what popped up was things like COVID-19 is killing black people or why is um, you know the coronavirus killing black people at a much higher rate or black people in New York City twice as likely to die, et cetera. I then did COVID Hispanic. What do we see? We see higher incidence in uh, minority communities, including Latinos, um, much more likely if you see here um, to say that someone in a household has had a pay cut or lost a job or devastated. Same thing, COVID, American, India, Alaska, Native. I didn't feed anything into the system other than just typing these words. We see COVID-19 in homeless urban Indians. We see American Indians and Alaska Natives have a higher risk of serious illness if infected with coronavirus. Um, COVID Asian, right? So here, when we think about the fact that we are in the middle of a pandemic, but we are also dealing with um, very serious um, issues as it relates to discrimination and racism. And so we see here how COVID-19 inflamed racism towards um, Asian Americans. We don't feel safe is one of the quotes and the Asian fight against discrimination. So again, on top of trying to just stay alive um, and not catching a very serious illness, we are also dealing with these types of issues. And then I just recently typed COVID white. And I don't think much needs to be said here, except, you know, it's interesting that the word white here was, in, it appears um, really associated with the White House. And so what, we, what sort of popped up was things related to COVID in the White House. We see things like another top eight test positive or White House COVID outbreak. And so, with none of these did we see something saying, oh, there were these biological mechanisms by which you know, certain groups had some innate immunity, et cetera. What we really saw was really what's happening in society in terms of thinking about um, transmission risk and thinking about populations that we have known in many other cases are often um, the same groups that are disproportionately burdened by illness and disease and poor health outcomes. And so one of the things, which I'm sure all of you know, is that we have to make sure we're all on the same page with what it is exactly that we are capturing when we are using results from um, you know, self-reported race ethnicity within surveys, or also you know, thinking uh, more broadly within a lot of our registries. So what is it exactly you know, that we are capturing here? So one of the things that we know is that often we are not doing some type of genetic ancestry or genetic um, you know, markers. What we are using is self-reported information. And so you know, one of the things I did was reach out to many of the leaders of NIH institutes to ask, do we have a standard definition for race and ethnicity? And one of the things that they did was point me to a commentary that they wrote in JAMA in 2018, where they essentially had brought together a group of experts to then say, we need to come together on a consensus on how race and ethnicity data are being used in biomedical research. And so one of the things that they really pointed out is that we need to make sure that how how we are you know really using this information is perpetuating the myth that race is a biological fact so that was really you know a key thing here that they wanted to point us to to say you know much of what we are capturing is not really biology it's really you know how people are being treated within a social context Another thing that we know is, again, in many of these surveys and in, in many of these registries, we use the same racial and ethnic categories that we, um, you know, see used within the U.S. Census, 
and these adhere to the 1997 Office of Management and Budget Standards on Race and Ethnicity. And so again, those same categories, white, black or African American, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian or even Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, again, follow these exact same standards. And so why not go again to the source? So I went, you know, simply to the US Census website and they now have a page about race as again, it is captured within the census. And you know, what is highlighted here is basically saying the racial categories included in the census generally reflect a social definition of race recognized in this country and not an attempt to define race biologically, et cetera. And so, you know, again, you know, really thinking about what it is that we're describing, because I think that, you know, once we're all on the same page in terms of what we're describing, why certain populations are always the same with many of these poor outcomes, then we can really focus on identifying what factors are contributing to these disparities so that we can then eliminate the factors or address them in a way that moves us closer to a state of health equity. And so again, COVID-19 and many of the other um, diseases and conditions that we are describing are generally defined as health disparities. Health disparities are, um, one of the definition of health disparities is that these are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. And where we want to be is a state of health equity, where every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential. And no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. And so now in the middle of a pandemic, this becomes more important than ever. Again, we have many of the same factors that are driving disparities across the board, yet again, showing up and again, leading us to a state where the same vulnerable populations are there again, experiencing the worst of the worst outcomes. So one of the models that we you know, really like to use in health, in, in health inequality, health equity or health disparities research Really, you know, we typically use models that reflect the social ecological uh, model of health. And what we know is that there are multiple levels of influence and there are multiple factors that are often at play at each of these levels. For example, <clears throat> this is one model that we developed several years ago, focusing on cardiovascular diseases and hypertension. But as you know, and as I know, Many of these same factors are, this, are the factors that are driving the disparities in COVID-19. For example, you know, at the individual patient level, yes, we know that an individual's income or earnings or wealth, et cetera, as well as you know, thinking about experiences of racism, um, health literacy, and abilities to adhere to um, you know, lifestyle or uh, prescribed medications, all of that plays a role and what happens across the board. Let's think at the family or social support um, level, family dynamics. For example, here, we think about COVID-19 um, transmission risk and what happens within the context of households or thinking about the types of jobs that family members have and how this could influence the health of individual patients. Let's think about at the provider or organizational level thinking about things like patient-centered communication skills, thinking about cultural competency, or even this concept of trustworthiness. And so we often say things like, well, there are people from certain groups who just don't, quote, trust the system. But we have to stop and reflect and ask ourselves, are we doing the best job improving ourselves to be trustworthy? And so thinking about things like this, or even the organizational culture of the health system itself, is there appropriate decision support with appropriate languages or health literacy levels? And then also, you know, thinking about, do we have care coordination? Are people able to easily see primary care doctors as well as specialists that are needed to then um, achieve their optimal health? So all of these things play a role. We also know 
that what happens at the community level and the policy level greatly influences an individual's health. For example, let's think about neighborhoods. We now know that neighborhoods with very high rates of poverty or even neighborhoods that are racially segregated have very different outcomes than well-integrated neighborhoods and those with higher levels of income. Let's think about food availability. We take it for granted, like having access to a grocery store, a supermarket, or even thinking about you know, online ordering for um, our shopping. At the beginning of this pandemic, that was one of the things that was recommended to order online or you know, to have your food delivered to you. But we know that that's not available in every neighborhood. And that also has implications. Let's think about you know, crime rates if we are um, asking people to engage in physical activity, but not just crime rates. Let's also think about the relationship between members of the community and those in law enforcement. There are people who are afraid to walk around certain neighborhoods for a, a, a number of reasons, but this is one potential reason. And then let's think at the state level. We know that states that expanded Medicaid coverage over the last few years have very different outcomes than those that have more strict requirements for Medicaid coverage. And then obviously at the national level, there is so much that influences what happens to individual people. For example, we know that you know, when we have certain mandates, either federally or at the state level, how that can impact risk transmission. But then also thinking about healthcare coverage and um, thinking about things like um, people not being excluded from coverage or having um, really enormous premiums. So all of these things play a role. Thinking again more specifically at COVID-19 transmission risk, we think again, as I mentioned, to our living conditions. So people who are, for example, living in crowded or multi-generational housing. And we know that many of these people are disproportionately Black or African-American or Hispanic or, Latin or Latinx. And so we also know that people who have family members or household members who are working in these essential frontline jobs also have a different transmission risk than those who do not. And that is important to think about when we know that the protections that are put in place at organizations or not put into place are greatly impacting a person's abilities to, pre to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Let's think about the fact that, you know, within many healthcare settings, a lot of our access to primary and specialty care really um, change to telemedicine. And that could have both good or bad um, consequences sort of based upon who the individual people are and the access to the resources. We know that you know, for many of the video services, we need to have steady internet um, service or access. But even when people have um, access to a computer or smartphone or the internet, we have, for example, some of our older adults who say that they didn't feel comfortable having to rely upon this as their primary source of care. So really thinking about all of these things. And then obviously, just like with anything else, thinking about you know, the impact of income or wealth or savings. And so we know when we went into um, a national lockdown, that we really saw what happens in terms of even now thinking about the rates of eviction. Some people are still laid off from their jobs. Do we have appropriate protections in place? Let's think about, again, health insurance inequalities and what it means to have private health insurance versus um, non-private health insurance. And then, unfortunately, we know that some of the people who are passing away now is not just due to direct consequences of COVID-19. Some of it is also due to other chronic health conditions that you know, may have become worse during this time period. We also know that people are dealing with a tremendous amount of stress, thinking about trauma and grief from watching what's happening to other community members or family members. And then last but not least, we have people who have very strong concerns about potential discrimination, violence, or even racism because of all that is happening. So this is just a figure that, you know, really coincides well with Dr. Forward's um, written testimony 
But, you know, again, it just highlights who is disproportionately working within service jobs and other public facing positions. And we see, you know, here on, on the graph that Black or African American and Hispanic and Latino persons are much more likely to end up in these forward facing positions. So again, thinking about having access to appropriate protections so that we don't continue to um, spread this condition, will spread COVID-19. And so again, thinking about the nature of the work and how certain communities are really relying upon protections being put into place at the organizational level. So one of the, um, one of the areas that is near and dear to my heart is chronic kidney disease. I do a lot of work related to chronic kidney disease and in particular access to transplants. And so um, a, a few weeks ago, a colleague of mine, Dr. Deidre Cruz, um, and I wrote a perspective in the Journal of the American Society of Nephrology. We talked about the fact that, you know, for example, kidney disease is one of those conditions, in particular, um, complete kidney failure or end stage kidney disease, is one of those conditions that, again, disproportionately impacts Black Americans. And, you know, we talk about things like all of these chronic conditions that are already disproportionately impacting, um, you know, certain communities, including Black or Hispanic or Latinx. And then now we, you know, layer COVID-19 on top of that. Plus, we now layer high profile acts of interpersonal racism on top of that. And now what we, you know, really talked about in this piece was the concept of weathering. You know, we talk about the fact that many of these patients are already dealing with so much. And every time we continue to layer something else on top of it, this is yet another adversity that the same groups are having to weather who already don't have appropriate protections by society in the first place. And so as providers, we have to really think about what is the role of the uh, medical community, the public health community, or in anyone else who cares about what's happening in society in trying to help alleviate some of these factors. And so th again, thinking about things that are not directly related to a transplant or not directly related to kidney disease care, but are very much important in influencing what happens. So thinking about things like grief or social isolation, food scarcity, loss of employment or income, or even thinking about, you know, this greater burden of COVID-19 illness and death and how that could lead to care delays and disrupted access to care. We all know that racism is something that, you know, again, is um, front and center. It was always here. It never completely went away, but we know that now, you know, there is national and international attention on what is happening from a, the perspective of very high profile acts of interpersonal racism. One of the things that, you know, we really want to remind everyone, and again, I'm sure you know, is that interpersonal racism is just one type of racism. One of the things that has always been um, a problem in terms of thinking about factors that influence health disparities is this concept of structural racism. Structural racism can be defined as mechanisms by which societies foster racial discrimination through systems of housing, education, employment, earnings, um, credit extension, in the media, healthcare settings, or criminal justice. And you know, we think about, for example, how our neighborhoods came to be. Why are there so many racially um, segregated neighborhoods or uh, neighborhoods that are segregated by income levels? Let's think, you know, about one, just one example of the types of policy structures that were in place. So for example, in, U, in many US cities, including, you know, we still see it today that we have these segregated neighborhoods. So how did we get here? So one practice was this practice of redlining, where, you know, many, um, you know, banks were literally drawing red lines around portions of the map to indicate areas in which a mortgage lender did not want to make loans, for example, to Black or African American persons or other, um, you know, quote, people of color. And so again, this has long-term implications in terms of thinking about generational wealth, in terms of thinking about generational health or illness. And all of these things are playing a role 
and why this country looks the way that it does, and many countries look the way that they do, even today. And these are things that we have to think about and, and tackle head on if we really want to make a long-term differences in, in really moving us closer to a state of health equity. So the final part of my talk is really, you know, thinking about what are our potential solutions. So, you know, I've talked about a lot of problems, but I always like to, you know, leave the audience with thinking about, well, what is it that we can do? Or what is it that others are, you know, doing to try and address these issues? So here at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity, um, you know, our mission is to promote health equity for socially at-risk populations through advancing scientific knowledge, through educating and training leaders, and through partnering with communities to raise public awareness of health inequities and to promote sustainable changes in practice and policy. And so this was just a photo with our community advisory board and several members of the, the faculty and staff at our um, Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity holiday um, gathering that we had, I believe, uh, in December. And so these are sort of just highlighting what some of the key initiatives are at the center. So as I mentioned, we have a very active community advisory board and a very active stakeholder engagement core where we have about 50 partners, including health system partners, that help us to conduct our research. So one um, study, for example, is the Rich Life Project, which is funded by PCORI and the NIH. And the goal is to, is to test multiple uh, collaborative care um, models, including one that involves community health workers, a nurse care manager, and then also access to a remote uh, specialty consultation with primary care providers to see if this helps to address long-standing disparities in uncontrolled hypertension in the state of Maryland and Pennsylvania. We also have the Five Plus Nuts and Beans for Kidneys trial here in Baltimore, which is really targeting um, you know, people who already have some signs of kidney damage. And this uh, trial is testing whether or not um, dietary coaching along with an income supplement or delivery of food that meets you know, the DASH diet guidelines helps to prevent um, further damage to the kidneys. And then finally, we have the Adinkra study as another example. And this is a study being conducted in Ghana where we are using many of the same models that were developed in the Rich Life Project to then test whether or not these uh, models can work within healthcare settings in Ghana to see if we can again impact hypertension. And one of the things that has sort of happened sort of across studies since the beginning of the pandemic is that these projects are now also asking the participants about what their experiences have been during COVID-19 and also what additional support they need so that their existing chronic illnesses don't become worse. And that's important because as I mentioned, we do have people who are dying due to existing conditions that they already have. And then finally, the core that I lead is our education and training core where we have um, multiple health equity courses, which I'll highlight on the additional slides, but we also have a monthly health equity jam session where um, we have presentations on different health equity research topics with um, either faculty members or even sometimes trainees here at Hopkins and other institutions. And right now, you know, those are virtual. So, and I will share um, an email address if you all would like to join our email list. And then we also have um, opportunities for individualized training for people who want to work one-on-one -on -one with one of our center faculty members. So our center director, Dr. Lisa Cooper, as well as Dr. Josh Starfstein here at Johns Hopkins, um, wrote a political um, opinion piece um, right at the beginning of the pandemic, really highlighting what some of the key things were needed to really help the most vulnerable groups. And many of these are things that we now see um, in place. So for example, at the time, we were not tracking COVID-19 cases stratified by race, ethnicity, or geography. And so you know, it took many of our leaders in public health and health equity to really make the case for why that was important. And we now see why, because we can now try to direct our resources appropriately when we know which communities are hardest hit. They talked about the importance of communicating and building trust. 
And so we have to address these longstanding issues. For example, now that we um, have ongoing trials for uh, potential treatments or vaccines, again, this issue of trust with these same communities is something that, again, is at play. Thinking about enhancing access to testing and healthcare, at one point, we all know that people needed to actually have, um, you know, a note from a doctor to get tested, or in some places, you had to have a car. So, you know, now we have multiple ways of doing this, but again, that took public health advocacy so that our policymakers and others could understand the value in it. We are still advocating to do more to protect our essential and in particular our low-wage workers and also to provide needed social services to keep vulnerable groups safe. So one of the things that we also do is work very closely with um, you know, faculty members and staff at the Johns Hopkins Urban Health Institute. Um, several of us are affiliated with both the Center for Health Equity and the Urban Health Institute. And so these are some of our COVID-19 health equity research projects that are um, supported by the Urban Health Institute. So I'm partnering with um, a ministry here in Baltimore that really is bringing together about 250 African-American faith leaders and other congregants here in Baltimore to assess COVID-19 concerns and to develop a novel health equity educational curriculum. And we have other faculty members, and these are just examples of some of the work. And this is not even, you know, all of the work, but we thought that it would be good to highlight. So another project um, being led by Dr. Carmen Alvarez here is looking at our frontline workers and thinking about what additional support is needed to many of those who are facing, you know, all of these additional roles in the middle of this pandemic, in particular, our community health workers. And then we have Dr. Dennis Antoine, who is leading a study looking at telehealth delivery of behavioral health services for homeless persons at one of our, um, you know, partners here helping up mission. So again, thinking about the fact that we have people who had long-standing issues already that we don't want to make worse, and we want to, you know, really think about doing the best that we can to help people. So this is what I sort of already talked about, you know, our monthly seminars, our health equity jam sessions. We have two courses here in the Bloomberg School of Public Health, but we also have some um, freely available courses online, which I'll highlight. And this is our website. So healthequityhub.com is our website if you would like to learn more about um, different training opportunities at the Center for Health Equity. And our email address is healthequitytraining at jhmi.edu if you would like to get added to our listserv to get the announcements about our jam session. So these are the two courses that I mentioned that are available on Coursera now. So the first is Foundations for Health Equity Research. In our second course, Applications of Health Equity Research Methods for Practice and Policy. And so both of these are active now, and I think we've had over 2,000 learners in the past um, several, several weeks. And then, you know, finally, we are actually celebrating our 10-year anniversary at the Center for Health Equity, and we will have a special event in place of our normal jam session next month on November the 11th. And so um, we will hear from our center director about you know, the vision for the, uh, the initial version of our center, which was actually called the Hopkins Center to Eliminate Cardiovascular Health Disparities. And now we you know, transition to the Center for Health Equity to think more comprehensively about things that need to happen. And we'll also hear from different associate directors about you know, some of the milestones and also where we need to kind of go to really advance health equity more broadly. And you know, as I mentioned, we have special topics. For example, this was a, a special event that we had on maternal health equity last year. We know that there are you know, extremely high rates of maternal death, in particular among Black and African American here and we um, here in the US. And we wanted to really highlight that in a way that helped to drive the conversations. And we have our newsletter, Health Equity Happenings. And so, you know, I, get, I hope that from this talk, the biggest takeaway is that what's happening now with COVID-19 is not necessarily new or surprising, unfortunately. Many of the same factors that are driving health inequities across the board are yet again impacting these same communities. 
but because we know that we have many shared factors, that means that we can come up with a plan to tackle these factors. And now, you know, that we all are aware of them, we really all are responsible for what happens in the next five to 10 years or longer. We really owe it to, you know, make this a better world to do all that we can in trying to address these factors, but also in making sure that we have people coming behind us who are doing the exact same thing. So I thank you for listening. This is the end of, um, I guess, the lecture piece of this, and I'm happy to take any questions now. Dr. Purnell, thank you for such an important presentation. So for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes, we'd like to take some questions from the audience. And we'll try our best to accommodate as many questions as we can. Um, however, if your question does not get covered, you can reach out to Dr. Purnell through the Center for Health Equity, and we will share an email in the chat. And remember to submit your questions to Tori Calgar via the chat function. So uh, the first question we have is, uh, is in the context of COVID-19, from a national standpoint, lots of data is being collected in terms of who is being infected and impacted. What discussions are underway in terms of protecting patient privacy and avoiding unintended consequences for patients? Um, well, that's a great question. So I think, you know, first of all, <clears throat> that we always have to, you know, really still adhere to the same HIPAA requirements, right? So we can't uh, release information in a way that is easily identifiable. And actually one of the things that we are learning during this uh, point in time, for those of us who conduct research, is that getting uh, projects approved now through the IRB is even more stringent than before. And I think because of the very charged nature of people wanting to protect their privacy. And so our same institutional review boards, uh, boards that are in, you know, at different organizations are still charged with making sure that you know any research is conducted in a way that still adheres to our ethical requirements but then in addition to that we know that our hipaa guidelines are still very much in play in terms of protecting um, patient information and so we certainly want to be respectful of uh, people not feeling like that you know they are becoming targets within their communities or neighborhoods and to my you know knowledge i'm not aware of a particular case in which that has happened so far, you know, thankfully. But I think, you know, we all have to very much be mindful of those same HIPAA protections. You know, when we think about, you know, I guess a few decades ago in the eight, late 80s, early 90s, it was the same thing in terms of thinking about people not wanting to uh, become publicly exposed who were diagnosed with HIV or AIDS, but we still had a responsibility, you know, at the public health level of making sure that there was essentially contact tracing then too. So, you know, my hope is that we've gotten even better than that now, but we certainly have um, national, state, and local protections that are supposed to be uh, making sure that we prevent that from happening. Um, so the next question we have from the audience is, uh, as you pointed out, this year has seen dual crises of the COVID pandemic and high profile acts of racism, how should the medical field support people in responding to these crises? Well, I think the very first thing that we have to do is validate uh, how people feel, right? We should not make people feel like, um, and this is just hypothetically speaking, but we should not make people feel like they owe us their trust or they owe us whatever it is that we feel, you know, that people should be feeling. We have to stop and pause and really, um, really be intentional. I think now more than ever before and really being thoughtful in how we communicate to others, including, you know, our colleagues. We know that um, in particular communities that are hardest hit, people are dealing with a lot in terms of thinking about stress and grief and, you know, it, it's really triggering to keep seeing these videos, to keep seeing these recordings. It's important and it's powerful, but it's also triggering. And so I think that 
now more than ever before, we have to go back to what it was, you know, that we were supposed to learn in kindergarten and first grade, that we need to be mindful of how we treat each other. We need to be mindful of assumptions that we make about others um, when people don't respond immediately or respond in a way that we, you know, that they naturally respond or that we expect them to respond. I think now we have to pause and be thoughtful and think about maybe why. But then I think we also, um, you know, those of us who, you know, may have some time available or who care about what's happening at our local levels, I think that this is, you know, now a great time to also just be um, really mindful about the fact that this is the time where the public is listening and this is the time where, you know, even when we have lots of activity and lots of energy, often people still welcome, you know, experts or welcome those of us who have um, just very directed training and knowledge in this field to then work very closely with our communities and trying to help to advance the agendas at the local levels as well. And then, you know, obviously, as people who are individuals impacted by what happens at the policy level, at every level, vote. We need to vote, you know? And I'm, I'm not saying what you need to vote for or against, but we need to exercise the right to vote because honestly, you know, in, in particular, thinking about the history of this country, people died for the right to vote. People are still dying when we think about, you know, people putting themselves at risk of COVID and potential transmission. So, um, you know, we have to really do the things that will make us good citizens. And I think that that will help to also spill over into our interactions with people, either as patients or participants or whatever. So if we are good human beings and we are kind to each other and kind to our communities, I think that that will help us in the long run. The next question we have is your work and that of other researchers has shown that Black Americans have higher rates of COVID transmission, morbidity, and mortality. Is any data being collected on racial disparities in the long-term health effects of COVID infection, such as what's being called like long haul COVID or um, lung conditions, that kind of thing? That's a great question. Um, I am not um, I don't know the extent to which it is. I mean, I guess the short answer is it could be derived if we, you know, have that information in terms of starting with who was, um, you know, the positive cases. But in terms of a longer term longitudinal cohort study, I'm not sure about that. I'm, I, I'm trying to think. I know that, you know, we here at our center are not necessarily um, doing that. I would imagine that that is something that you know some of our public health agencies may be considering but at or it may be something that also is sort of in progress that i'm just not aware of yet but um but that is certainly something that's important to have a longer term cohort study to know exactly what's happening to people of various ages and especially you know younger um, adults or children if we now see that this is something that you know may be lifelong or at least um, long term then it will be important for us to know what's happening to people so i will also be watching out for what's happening with that excellent question uh, the next question we have is uh what does the research say about the impact of access to care, quality of care, and discrimination and bias in the provision of healthcare in terms of the effect of COVID. So what does the research say about, will you repeat it again? Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I am. Um, okay. So, yeah, so the question is, uh, in regards to COVID, Mm -hmm. I guess, what research is being done and what does the research find about the impact of access to care, quality of care, and, and discrimination and bias in the provision of health care um, in terms of uh, racial disparities? Okay, well, I know here, one of the things that, you know, we're doing is asking our study participants about their experiences with uh, potential interrupted access to care or whether or not, you know, they've been able to adequately um, really use um, telemedicine. Have they been still tracking, for example, 
um, their own outcomes in other conditions, for example, blood pressure during this time, even if they weren't actively seeing their doctors. And we're sort of following them to kind of see what happens in terms of their, um, you know, disease management, I guess we'll say. But in terms of thinking about, you know, COVID specific bias or COVID specific access, we have been, you know, sort of hearing anecdotally different stories, especially earlier in the pandemic, about people living in certain states or in certain communities who were being turned away when they, you know, presented with certain symptoms. And again, this was really at a point where it was much harder to get um, access to testing. But, you know, we saw and heard, you know, multiple stories about people feeling like if, um, you know, they came from certain communities or were members of certain populations that they, that their concerns were not being treated as seriously. We saw stories about, you know, some members of Black or African American families saying that, oh, well, my loved one passed away. Um, we went and we tried to go to the ER, but we were told that you're not sick enough now. And we came home and the person passed away at home. And so, you know, we saw many of those anecdotes but, you know, in terms of thinking about an actual research study to then go back and maybe, I guess, retrospectively look at, you know, what's happening to people across the board. I think, again, that that's something that will be very valuable to us, in particular, um, thinking about longer term uh, prevention or even testing strategies. But, you know, one of the things that we know is that where, where you live matters and where you live plays a great role in, in many cases in terms of your experiences with care. Um, so I'm originally from Mississippi. And at one point, you know, I was hearing very different stories with some of my loved ones there, you know, in terms of thinking about what was happening in the communities, thinking about, you know, hospitals being overburdened and, you know, thinking about people getting turned away or not necessarily having ready access to testing. And so, you know, we think about the fact that these experiences of bias or discrimination, et cetera, are still things, they never stopped, right, with COVID. And so those are things that we deal with. But on top of that, now having this um, double issue of, I guess, resource allocation and, you know, how that varies so greatly based upon just what's available to you at the local level, I think is becoming the perfect storm, right? And so we have to really think about, well, the first thing we should have done was, was more to eliminate some of these issues in the first place. But now that we're here, it is something that, you know, we've certainly heard stories about anecdotally. And I imagine that when a longer term study comes out to ask people about their experiences, we will also see a lot of this um, unfolding as well. Uh, the next question says, early explanations for the racial and ethnic inequities in COVID mortality often centered on explanations of individual behavior and um, underlying conditions. Could you comment a little more about how these explanations may be limited or incorrect? Um, so these explanations are certainly not aligned with what those of us who are uh, working in the field for health equity know. Um, in terms of thinking about the true underlying factors that are driving um, differences in entire subpopulations of people. We cannot, um, you know, we cannot personal responsibility ourselves out of, you know, a neighborhood with poor access to testing or resources or care. We can't personal responsibility ourselves out of working in, um, you know, jobs that don't have adequate protections or, you know, having a disproportionate number of people from one subpopulation versus another who's able to work from home and still get a salary, whereas, you know, we have others who have to go in in person to get hourly wages. So we can't personal responsibility ourselves away from the protections that society owes to all of us and that, you know, has never been adequately addressed. And so that's sort of what I would, you know, kind of say to that. And you, you may hear a little bit of a difference in my tone because, you know, quite frankly, I think that that type of language is dangerous. I think that it is short-sighted. And I think that, um, honestly, it is insulting to the members of our communities who, 
a very different lived experience. And also to those of us who are doing all that we can to try and, and truly help to bring us closer to a state of health equity. So I do thank you for that question. And I thank you for even, um, you know, implying within the question that that's not necessarily the right perspective to have. You know, people can feel however they choose, but knowing that there are all of these structural barriers and all of these different examples of structural racism that got us where we are today, it is short-sighted, it is wrong, it is irresponsible, and it is inappropriate to say that the burden is on the individual to make it through all of the different levels of factors that influences an individual person's health. So that's my response to that. Um, sort of similarly related question. Um, in addition to the provision of PPE, uh, what are the most effective ways to prevent frontline workers? So I think that, you know, in addition to PPE, thinking about things like allowing people who are sick to actually be at home when they are sick, not having people feel like that, you know, their jobs will be on the line if they miss a day. So thinking about things like, um, you know, we now see many places that have mandates for masks for customers who come in. We know that that has now, for some reason, become politically charged. I don't understand in the first place why um, life or death, uh, you know, for human beings and just behaviors that we know helps to protect our health and our lives. I don't understand in the first place how we ended up with that becoming politics, but we are here. And so we have certain uh, places where states no longer have these mandates and, you know, it's really at the level of the organization to then enforce or not enforce it. We have, you know, we can think about things like capacity um, of the number of people in a place at one time so that uh, people can adequately distance themselves both from the employees, but also from each other. And let's think about, you know, other things. For example, if um, employees are saying that I am having symptoms or I am concerned about potential exposure, Let's think about whether there are policies in place to help people to get testing or even making sure that they have adequate coverage to help with treatment if that's needed. So, you know, I think that all of these things, um, in addition to the PPE, are important factors that could greatly influence what happens to our essential workers. Um, along those lines, uh, what advice do you have for public health researchers who want to use research findings to promote changes in policy? Oh, that's another great question. So, you know, you know, I love it because it first recognizes the value of um, engaging with the policy world, right? It's not enough for us to do these amazing studies and submit them and publish them and then disappear. Like that's just part of the work, right? So what many, and I can use, you know, myself and others here as an example, what many of us, you know, often do is once we are working in a particular field or area and, you know, for example, we make recommendations about what are some of the things that could um, influence the results in a different way, then often, you know, we see, well, who are the policymakers who already care about these topics? So sometimes there are opportunities to be called as an expert witness. Um, for example, if there are new pieces of legislation that are being, um, you know, thought about or discussed, that could happen at your, at your city or local level, that can happen at the state level or the national level. There are times where um, people may not even be thinking about your particular topic, but you may find out that there are policymakers who care about health equity, period, right? So sometimes what that means is, in our case, we actually have local policymakers who are part of our community advisory board. So they get regular updates about our research findings, and they get updates about some of the factors and some of the things that we've learned, lessons learned, that will improve the health of a community. But if there are opportunities or topics that you feel should be on the agenda, many um, times we, there is a way for just members of the public to come and to speak openly at different hearings or even at you know, city council meetings, et cetera. So you know, I always encourage people to be actively involved in what's going on you know, at the policy level, but also just 
at the level of interacting with your community members and you know we think about neighborhood associations we have some neighborhood associations who have very close ties with our local policy makers and thinking about you know just things that are on the agenda and the relationships that are already established so I hope that you know that's helpful in just thinking about some of the ways that we can help to translate over our research findings to the policy world. But then also remembering that there's a whole different language when we are talking to policymakers and members of the general public. We don't go in talking about odds ratios and relative risk and et cetera, because honestly, nobody cares. And you know, I learned that as a doctoral student. I, I learned that by giving my elevator pitch to, to one of my family members who was a state representative. And if he tuned me out in 30 seconds or cut me off, I know well, that wasn't the right approach, right? And so some of that just ends up coming with over time practicing. And so the more that you can do, even as a trainee, to get involved with members of other fields or other sectors and thinking about the language and what's important and what matters to them, I think that that will also help you to get calls when these, um, you know, when these issues end up on their radars as well. So all of these play a role. I think so. That's about all we have time for in terms of uh, questions. So on behalf of the Center for Communicable, Communicable Disease Dynamics and the Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health, I'd like to thank Dr. Purnell for joining us today and for this great discussion. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you for tuning in for the fourth talk of the COVID-19 and Health Inequities Seminar Series. And we hope to see you at the next and last presentation uh, next Thursday, October 22nd, featuring Dr. Joseph Lenard from the UC Berkeley School of Public Health and Dr. Maximiliano Cuevas from Clinica de Salud del Valle de Salinas and their talk on SARS-CoV-2 infection among California farm workers in Monterey County. Thank you all again for joining. Thank you. Thanks.